Welcome to the Developer Success Podcast. Today, we've got a special guest, and it's really exciting because he just landed a new role. We'll talk a little bit about that. But today we have Irvinder Singh, uh, who is a senior technology executive with 20 plus years of IT hands-on experience, delivering mission-critical projects, primarily in the financial services industry. Uh, he led enterprise-wide technology platforms and engineering solutions for clouds, digital, and data transformation programs. And he managed global teams to deliver card as a service platforms and open banking solutions. Um, he championed the API execution strategy and drove the modernization of cloud native services and data analytics capabilities on Azure and AWS. He's passionate about partnering with business leaders to deliver digital banking and payment solutions and elevating the technological systems to world-class standards. Welcome, Evendith. Really, really happy to have you on our podcast today. I'm really excited to like catch you just in, in that window in between in between roles and really looking forward to digging in and, and learning more about uh, you know how, how you do your thing. So thank you, Christoph, uh, for inviting me for this podcast. And I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to this engaging discussion. <laughs> so we have this opening question on this podcast um, where we always like to ask, um, I already gave you a little bit of a primer, but I always like to ask people, you know, what do you think about when, um, when you hear developer success? What does that mean for you? I know we talk about developer experience. We want to provide the best experience to our developers. But developer success to me is more than that. I think if the developers, they are able to integrate their services to the third party uh, vendors, to the partners, to the internal services quickly, and they are able to launch the services to the market quickly, I think that's a big success because then they can deliver the business outcomes, which are very important for the developer, and they can showcase the value that the developers they bring in within the organization. So to me, that's a big developer success where they can get frictionless experience, they can easily integrate services, the services are visible, and they are able to build innovative solutions. Irvinder, you, you've now got 20, more than 20 years of experience and primarily working in the financial services industry. So you must have a really, really broad, a high level overview over how things are evolving and changing over the years and the IT and dash business landscape. So what, what have you seen? What are like the primary takeaways of like the strategy shifts that you've seen happening? and that are still ongoing today. Yeah, so I know uh, everyone is talking about generative AI these days, chat GPT, <laughs> AI is everywhere. So there are a um, lot of changes that are happening. Technology is growing at an exponential rate. And uh, I see now the trend uh, of more platforms, banking as a platform, card as a service platform. That trend is definitely evolving in the U.S. And using APIs, using the BN model, domain-driven design, microservices, and build these capabilities, aligning all of the technology capabilities with the business outcomes uh, and deliver all of these business capabilities as a platform so that you can scale this platform on um, the uh, private, hybrid, public cloud. I see that trend is definitely emerging. So, so it's basically uh, turning traditional companies um, that might have been working in silos more into like really platform companies, basically. Yeah, that, and then a lot of transformation, moving away from point-to-point -point interfaces, monolithic yeah. applications, legacy services, and moving that concept of application to more services-based, microservice-based, uh, and also having um, this... Uh, Agile delivery model using APIs and flexible services that you can plug and play. Uh, I think that's that's what is happening in the organization. I have a pet peef or like a theory, <laughs> so I don't want to try it on you. Uh -huh. So you you said like moving from an application based model 
to a more uh-huh. service-based model. So uh-huh. I have this theory, and I'm not sure if it's true, but that's, uh-huh. uh, that's um, you know, we, we've evolved from uh, a point-to-point integration where you had to like custom custom built integration on both sides. Mm-hmm. Then we've evolved to uh, uh, like an API to app to, uh, or like, you know, to backends or, or sorry, um, an, a person to a app to API to backends kind of model. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I suspect that with the rise of uh, generative AI, and we'll, we'll see how fast this hype goes and how long it runs, but mm-hmm. we'll see that. But mm-hmm. I suspect that um, there's a chance that this idea that you always have to consume APIs through an app or like through a dedicated purpose-built app that is con- that is constraining the experience, that that is possibly also going away so that we are, we're going to have more one-off API hits that are just like getting a, a, a really short uh, burst of, of API productivity uh, in, a, in a less constrained format. Do you think that that's going to happen or what do you think about that? Yeah, and I think that is already happening. Uh, uh-huh. As you said, there was a lot of technical debt and a lot of customizations and point-to-point integrations that were there in the companies. And now they are moving away to APIs and microservices. And instead of having these different applications, uh, which are for different purposes, now what is happening is you are building different business capabilities, different domains, and you are mm-hmm. aligning the microservices to those domains so that you can independently consume the microservices from multiple channels, from multiple apps, and you don't need uh, a specific app to consume API. So you can consume it across multiple channels, multiple apps um, to launch different type of capabilities. So that, that is happening that final step of like an, an artificial intelligent agent that is consuming APIs completely outside of a context of an app. Do you also see that? That's like the future where we're heading or what do you think about that? I, I think uh, that's the future we are heading. The main, uh, I would say, um, challenge is the design, how you design the API so that mm-hmm. it is generic so that it can scale, it can be consumed, not through apps, but also through these uh, agents, through these uh, AI applications, through different channels. So I think uh, that is very important, how you design that API so that you can use that API for different purposes and also for AI. Yeah, like I've heard some people talk about the the resurrection of hypermedia APIs. <laughs> well, it's not resurrection, but uh-huh. kind of like hypermedia APIs becoming uh, really into focus again because we now have smart clients. Yeah, it, it's it's really exciting and interesting times for sure. Yeah, I think it's exciting. Um, I would say the only challenge is that you have to make sure. Um, when the APIs uh, are designed, developed, deployed, security is uh, one of the key factors that uh, should be considered so that when it is consumed across multiple set of applications, multiple channels, then you are able to secure the API. The second uh, challenge is the data privacy to make sure if the data has to be protected, how we are ensuring the data privacy for that API. And then the third one I would say is uh, the visibility, the monitoring aspect. That's also very important. When the API is consumed across different chatbots and AI uh, agents, uh, we have to make sure that there is proper monitoring so that it can be uh, properly measured how the traffic is consumed, uh, what is the volume, and then also you can also look at how you have to monetize those capabilities. It, and it's, I think it's also, there's a shift from authorizing apps to authorizing 
uh, jobs to be done. That's really, really interesting. Uh, yep. Uh, that that's going to be necessary. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we have to develop some new models for that. How we have to yeah. do that uh, because this is evolving. Yes. Uh, so interesting. We look. We're, we're thinking about similar <laughs> similar directions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Super exciting. I hinted at it in the introduction. You're starting a new job tomorrow, and like, well, by the time this will be published, you'll you'll already be in underway, running uh, in your new role. As you've been transitioning between companies, what have been like the, the changes that you've seen in how companies think about like w- what they're trying to do with their digital transformations? Uh, is that evolving fast or or that's more, more or less the similar things that they keep trying to do from company to company, but like maybe the technology changes or or how, how is that evolving? So I see uh, the latest trend these days, everyone is talking about... Um, chat GPT and generative AI, and uh, we definitely have to put together the strategy, especially the CIOs and the leaders, they have to put together the strategy, short term, long term, how they are going to leverage this new technology uh, Mm -hmm. so that they can add comparative advantage to the business, because this is a must, uh, because if the companies, they don't uh, leverage this new technology, they'll be left behind. Mm -hmm. Um, So I see now there is a lot of focus on, yes, um, how to use some of these technologies in combination with other technologies that we have. Like we have been talking about cloud transformation, digital transformation, data transformation, modernization, but now how we can use AI, generative AI, in combination with digital transformation, with cloud, I think that's very important. And to have both short-term, long-term strategy, this technology is still not that mature and it's evolving, but Mm -hmm. I know the senior leaders, they have to put together the strategy and the execution plan, how they are going to leverage this uh, new technology trend. Actually, I wrote a blog post about this, that uh, I feel that, a lot of the focus is on how are we going to use the technology rather than how are we going to enable the technology. And I'm sure that you have some ideas about that as like, you know, with, with your architecture hats, uh, like as a future um, director of architecture, what do you think is more important, enabling or using? Yeah, so recently I had interacted with some industry leaders to understand what are the opportunities? Definitely, there are a lot of use cases. And we can identify use cases in all industries. Like I was looking at from credit card industry in payments, there are huge opportunities. So there are a lot of use cases. But as you mentioned, how you have to enable the technology is very important. So we have to now look at how we can partner with some of the startup companies and how we can enable this technology um, and build some of these co-pilots for some of the platforms for which we need to enable this technology and how that can be done, making sure we are able to take care of data privacy, security, as well as the regulations that we have, especially if we are in the financial services industry, we have to make sure that uh, we are looking at from that lens also, that we are looking at from the regulatory point of view, that we are able to uh, enable this technology, which is secure, scalable, and also mature. And how does this play together with some of the other trends? Um, Like, for example, open banking, Mm -hmm. which has been really huge in Europe, and, and the whole PSD2 initiative kind of like pushed that forward. But like we've seen now more and more banks in the U.S. that are also embracing uh, open banking capabilities and that are, are uh, trying to make sure that they're also not left behind on, on, on that area. Like you've been seeing this firsthand, very close up. How is this evolving? Because it's a very different approach than in Europe where it was just like, okay, everybody has to do this now. Go, go, go. <laughs> in the U.S. it's much more market driven, right? Is that correct? Yeah, I see that. This is um, well uh, adopted in Europe, in Asia, in Singapore, 
and they have put together some controls some standards um like the the singapore uh, regulatory body uh, and in europe with the psd2 standards so there are some good standards so what kind of data you can expose how you can expose what consent you need to take from the consumer so i think it's well established in europe in us i see that the trend is evolving everyone is talking about banking as a service card as a service platform but i think there needs to be more focus on some standards and some regulations um in the us with which we can see more adoption of apis open banking apis i've got the feeling that a lot of banks in us are still see, are seeing it as a as a competitor arena rather than a collaboration arena uh, is that yeah. is that true yeah yeah I, i think that's true uh, because there are a lot of technology companies lot of startup companies they are um, built from the ground up using cloud native services apis so yes so big banks they see that as a threat and they have to open up their platforms and apis to be competitive in this industry i i've seen this uh, in other in other industries like like for example in the in the telco industry there's a sense of you know we need to work together and we have to collaborate because if we don't collaborate um some startup aggregator will pop up that's going to eat our our lunch and and you know and we're just going to be relegated to to some sort of um a backend like a dumb backend that that's not in touch with customers anymore is that is that realization already dawning i've seen a lot of people trying to win at developer experience and it's great that they care about developer experience but i think it's okay to be boring with developer experience but you have to be exciting with developer marketing and i think these two are distinct uh, that's uh, and although that they're often used interchangeably you'll see developer relations and and uh, developer advocates that will talk about uh developer experience as a competitive advantage and while that is true i believe that um as the market matures and the solutions are becoming more standard that uh, spending lots and lots of money on building custom developer experience might not be the right thing for everybody but i'm not sure um it is it, i don't know if that that is the route that banks are going in us because it's it, there's no regulatory body that's saying like you know everybody needs to implement it this way and and you know go 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 i think there are some silos um mm-hmm. i know um all big banks and companies they they are looking into how to provide better developer experience but again we don't have some kind of a joint collaboration across yeah. the industries especially in the financial services maybe in the telco industry it might be happening but there are silos but everyone is looking at from that lens how we can provide better developer experience and how we can add competitive advantage yeah. so yeah as you said yes slowly there will be more shift toward okay yes developer experience is important but how that's going to add value so value add services business outcomes how we can achieve that so that we can say that yes this is a success for the developer so i think that would uh, be more important yeah it's it's like developer experience and it's an approximate goal it's not the ultimate goal it's the outcome that you're achieving with your developer experience that is a real goal it's going to be interesting to see how like how how the market evolves and what the difference is going to be between the implementations in the US and implementations in Europe other places where there's been a more of a regulatory approach uh, to open banking yeah and also sometimes it becomes too late to enforce some kind of a standard and uh, right. regulatory approach because i see that now the way generative ai is expanding and it will be in the hands of every developer uh and it will be on every phone now uh it is seamless and it's everywhere now you cannot uh, put breaks 
and put some controls or put some standards, uh, it's already too late. So, yeah. so that's yeah. another thing that we have to look at how now we can put some kind of a control, how we can manage, because the, the speed at which it is growing and expanding, it's huge, enormous. Yeah. Yeah, and, and like one of the primary use cases for open banking was to avoid screen scraping. Uh, yep. Now AI is making screen scraping even easier. Um, yeah. One of the things that you've been responsible for is this uh, card as a service platform. Uh, can can you tell maybe a little bit more about like what, what is that and, and what the business value is of one of those programs? So card as a service platform, the main focus area is that we have to build this business capabilities so that if we have to launch a new credit card product, whether it is for general purpose, co-brand, small business, uh, we can leverage the same business capabilities and we can manage the complete lifecycle of cards um, uh, using those services. So I think that's the main focus area so that we have the platform, we have the business capabilities and we can reuse those business capabilities and we can launch a new credit card product to the market quickly. Uh, so that's the main focus area. And then it's it's also something that you could like white label and, and provide this as a, a service to others or it's primarily, it starts internal or or is, yeah, is that how it works? Yeah, yes. So, so you can definitely evolve into a white label solution, and but it will start from internal, and then you can expand yeah. the capabilities. Your role is like this architecture role. I, I think this is one of the key things that I'm always busy with. Is like how to bridge this gap between developers and business. The architect is clearly that bridge one of those bridging roles that is connecting the business to the developer sites and making sure that whatever is being developed in function of the business also makes sense from a long-term sustainable like a maintainability perspective so how do you practically do that um uh, when when you're fulfilling your role yeah so uh, i think this is uh, very important um because from developer perspective, they uh, they are very passionate about the technology. They see new technology, new tools. They always want to try uh, and get their hands dirty on the new technology. But when we look from the business perspective, uh, they are looking for how that's going, to, any new technology that we are going to deliver, how that's going to add value to the business, how we can add value, how we can... Uh, deliver outcomes. So uh, architect plays a key role. Architect can bridge the gap between the developer and the, and the business leaders to showcase that this is the technology that we are building and this would be the outcome and how we can get 10x ROI by using this technology. So how to use technology as a differentiator and how we can use technology to add strategic advantage to the business, that's very important. And architect plays a role to showcase that value that, yes, this is going to add value for the business, and that's why we need to do that. Because if if we uh, the developer says, oh, yeah, I want to use cloud technology, I want to use this technology, then we need to showcase the the business case, how that's going to add uh, the outcome, the value, the ROI, and also from the long-term sustainability point of view, if we are building a solution, then architect plays a key role to make sure that the solution is uh, scalable and sustainable for the future so that we can build the next-gen architecture and we have the forward-looking vision so that's also very important, which the architect works uh, as part of the team and then helps in making sure that it's uh, clearly visible to all the stakeholders. It's almost like a discoverability and findability uh, angle for um, like architectural artifacts and, and, and helping... Uh, like bridging that gap between the two sides of the business. Yep, that's correct. That is also kind of what a developer portal does. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we've we've been. Um, I think we first met 
I think because of the Deaf World Awards, right? Yeah. Was that a, yeah. So, so you've been involved with several developer portals uh, uh, along your career. Um, mm -hmm. what, what do you think is the, or what do you see as the role of developer portals in, in helping you with fulfilling that, that bridging function? Yeah, so um, developer portal uh, plays a big role because as we develop services, as we develop APIs, as we develop business capabilities, if we can have a catalog of all of the services, the business capabilities that are available in the organization that can be easily consumed, then we can break that silo. So the different um, teams can consume, can look at what capabilities are available, and we can have maximum reuse within the organization. So, uh, so developer portal plays a key role to have a catalog of services and also to make sure we have collaboration across the different teams within the organization and also outside of organization with our partners so that the, the developers can easily consume the existing business capabilities to build new innovative capabilities and there is maximum reuse within the organization. So developer portal, yeah, it's, it's a, a very good uh, marketing tool. It's a very good uh, tool to uh, expand reusability within the organization. Mm -hmm. And also it's a very good tool to encourage collaboration within the organization. Yeah, it's really the platform use case that's that I hear yep. is, is is really important. How have you seen the balance between the internal and the external use case? Because I feel that over the last couple of years that has been has been shifting. So it felt like a couple of years ago the primary use case was was external, like first first, was, and then it started becoming a. Um, like there's been more of a focus on the internal use case, like what, what you were just describing also. Do you see, have you also seen that shift? Or or is that, I, I know that they both need to be, or I believe they need to be both catered to, and we need to have um, probably separate assets for, for addressing both in, in an organization. But how how are you seeing this? Is this, um, do you also see the shift? Yeah, th there is a shift, uh, but I think there are multiple use cases for both external and internal, and the focus area is different. External um, API portal is more focused on uh, encouraging innovation, uh, making sure we can run uh, hackathons and uh, mobile challenge and we can open up, these are the capabilities and develop some new innovative offerings by partnering with uh, some of the startup companies and uh, our partners. So that's the focus area for external API portal. Now, internal API portal is more focused on uh, reusability, collaboration within the team, breaking the silos, making sure that we have the uh, visibility of existing business capabilities that other teams can also leverage, consume. So I see there is scope and opportunity uh, for both internal as well as external API portals. And uh, that's what I see that the trend is that um, we need to have both internal and external. We, uh, for external API portals, you have to put more focus on security because when you open up all these APIs and business capabilities to the partners, then you have to make sure the data is secure and data privacy. So those two areas become more critical when we are exposing our business capabilities and services on the external API portal. Yeah, both both sides are important, and there are, there are different purposes and and different things to to pay attention to. Yep. Um, so so um, as I I was hinting, like tomorrow, actually tomorrow, <laughs> which is really funny. Um, you're you're starting a new job. You just like you're actually just relocated for your next role, uh, and you're going to be te technology director as the head of architecture. How do you start with that kind of job? Like, what what's your what's your day like tomorrow? So my day would be very busy. Uh, tomorrow <laughs> uh, I will be uh, mostly um, 
uh, understanding the culture and there will be orientation and, and uh, i will give, uh, get the walk through of the facility and uh, meet different people and uh, so uh, it's a very um, tight agenda for tomorrow to mm-hmm. know about the company to know about the industry and to meet people uh, so i think that's what uh, i'm i'm going to be doing that tomorrow do you already have plans for like what you want to go out and and work on or like um, how you would like to approach that yeah uh, so there are uh, i'm very excited about this new role um, so i will be able to uh, do something for the community and uh, also there are a lot of transformation programs that are underway mm-hmm. so as i step into this role then i will also be able to add value to the organization as the organization is going through this transformation phase and rolling out new uh, platforms new systems so definitely i will have a plan 30 60 90 day plan yeah um, what to execute and uh, um, and then put together the strategy so that we have the long term execution plan in my new role let's talk a little bit more about developer portal still how we've seen the evolution of developer portals let's start with that and then uh, there's also a trend that i want to ask you specifically about like is is there is there something that you have seen happening and changing over the years if you are talking about the technology there is definitely change in the technology initially when the api portals were launched we were using drupal and then slowly um, companies they started developing api portals using some reactive frameworks and now there are some new technology uh, that the companies are looking at so there is definitely a shift in the technology to quickly develop launch api portals and i also see a shift for internal external facing portals you can definitely uh, use different set of technologies to launch different set of portals so that is definitely evolving on the technology front uh, i also see the trend that developer portals initially started with running this hackathons and uh, also now i see that uh, the trend is uh, shifting and uh, portals uh, become like the marketing tool for mm-hmm. the organizations so so you can market uh these are the business capabilities that are available and can be consumed by our partners by our developers so it has changed from a tool which was used for just for experimentation and now it has slowly evolved into a digital marketing tool uh, which uh, has become a necessity for the organizations to be competitive in the market because other companies they have um, this kind of uh, portal and that stands out so so that's also uh, that uh, there is a change and trend that is slowly evolving actually from the trends of developer portals becoming a digital marketing tool doesn't that mean that cms has become more important again so i've seen teams that are building custom built developer portals in react frameworks and that then have uh, like they can't get their business personas to contribute content because you know they're not comfortable with git repository or or they can't do as complex things in like a more a developer centric focused thing or they have to like get developers and designers involved to do content do you see that problem or 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 how do you see that with with react based developer portals yeah i i see that challenge is there but you mm-hmm. have to balance whether you want to use developer portals just for one persona or you want to have multiple personas and you don't want to just focus on just the uh, developer perspective but i have to also engage collaborate with the business leaders and how you have to also provide uh, a seamless onboarding experience to your portal so mm-hmm. yes content management uh, 
platforms play a big role. And if you can integrate and use some of those platforms as part of uh, your portals, then you can add more value. I have a bit of a bias, obviously, in this <laughs> rebuilt Drupal portals. But um, mm-hmm. would you would you recommend recommend companies then to build like uh, cust- like React frontends in front of Drupal portals, or or building some sort of compose systems instead? Or what what would that translate to then? Again, it uh, depends. Uh, mm-hmm. I would not say that you have to use this technology or that technology. There are pros and cons. Uh, If you want to use Drupal, yes, there are a lot of security vulnerabilities. You have to keep up with the version. Mm -hmm. If you are using uh, some out-of-the-box portals like Apigee portal, you have limited functionality. Uh, And then if you develop on your own using React, then there is a lot of custom development. So it's like you have to balance uh, how much effort you want to put in, how much customization you want to do, how much you can get out of the box from the content management systems, from some of these portals that are provided by some gateway providers. And then you can decide. And then how much of vendor agnostic way of consuming those APIs and developing those portals you want to go with. So you can definitely use some of these APIs that are provided by APG and build Mm -hmm. your own developer portals, but you have to look at the time and effort and the value and the outcome and the experience that you're going to provide. So, um, and once um, you put all those uh, Uh, capabilities and the outcome in perspective, then you can decide what will make sense. Again, it also depends on the size of the organization. It's a small company, big company, large company. Um, You want to have one portal, you want to have multiple portals, you want to have uh, one portal for every line of business, and you want to have a centralized team, decentralized team. So there are a lot of those factors that you have to look into. But again, Mm -hmm. Time, cost, and outcome, and experience. Yeah. All those four perspectives you have to look at and then decide what will make sense. So you were talking a little bit about technology choice for developer portals. And mm-hmm. uh, you, you talked about this, this uh, evolution where um, in the beginning or a couple of years ago, uh, a lot of people started with Drupal because some of the vendors were has had had made Drupal part of their product offering. And that mm-hmm. you've you've then seen like a lot of people starting to build in React and, and building uh, like custom developer portals. Mm-hmm. Um, if a team is now looking at this, trying to decide like how, what they should do, what would the, your recommendation be? Like how should you decide on what technology stack to choose for um, for your developer portal program? So I would say, uh, we should definitely um, experiment with some of the content management systems, the Drupal plugins, and what capabilities we can leverage from some of these open source frameworks. And uh, if we really want to be totally vendor agnostic, we want to use like if you're using APG Gateway, we want to use APG APIs, and we want to build our own custom. UI using React and build our portals. We should also look at what would be the effort, how much customization we'll have to do, and also for the long term, uh, how much we'll be spending in terms of maintainability. So I think maintainability aspect is very important when it comes to uh, building your own custom UI uh, or uh, using something which is already out there in the industry. We should look at the effort and uh, the long-term maintainability and uh, the cost perspective and then make a choice Mm -hmm. um, which option would be better in terms of launching it quickly to the market and also to be more cost-effective and also more maintainable uh, for Mm -hmm. the long-term situation. So I was joking about this because all the the points that you're saying, like... Like maybe you should consider open source and uh, the maintainability, um, not having to own it, 
all of these are, are it's kind of like our value proposition <laughs> but i was feeling awkward <laughs> to call it out but yeah so yeah it's it's great to see that confirmed and it's very easy i think for for teams that are developer centric to just start building something and then yeah uh yeah and and they might end up like basically rebuilding a cms which that's, is really that's, should that's not be the very point because yeah. if you leave it to the developer's hand they will definitely go on their own and build it on their own in React because yeah. <laughs> they want to be using latest intake and all that but then you will be building all of those capabilities of content management systems and for which the plugins are already there and it will be too time consuming and too much of effort in terms of long term maintainability yeah so then you're you're launching after one or two years or longer and then also you have a much much higher maintenance cost maintenance uh, cost no. uh, yeah 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 very very important points and thank thank you for mentioning those yes. <laughs> and uh, it's it's a uh, it's something i often have to to explain to people like oh but wait <laughs> be careful you know be it's, careful, a trap. Yeah. it's a trap <laughs> so it's a yes. trap. but people will not realize they get into this trap after six months or one and realize oh man this is a big yeah. trap why yeah. we didn't use something which is already there and someone is providing support yes providing support on top of drupal then why not go with them that that's the better option instead of rewriting everything on our own what is the takeaway that you would like people to have from this podcast like what are the what's like a core insight that you think if you have a a colleague architect who's who's just been promoted to you know head of apis or something like that or or um or someone who's who's like an API champion inside of an organization. Um, what is the key takeaways you would like to give them? The key takeaway I would say is if we are thinking of building the API portal for the enterprise, it's a transformation journey. It takes time, and the technology is evolving and changing at a rapid pace. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say that uh, instead of uh, running a centralized program for enterprise api portal we'll have to uh, also think how this can be decentralized there can be some portions where we need to have some centralized governance of api standards and uh, uh, how we are exporting our apis on the portal but there should be a decentralized way of uh, developing portals and uh, launching uh, the portals across different organizations uh, because speed to market is important and the technology is changing. So uh, we have to look at how uh, we can deliver the outcome, provide uh, a better uh, experience and success to the developers so that they can easily find, consume our services and launch this capability quickly to the market. And uh, if that means we have to partner with Microsoft, we have to partner with Google, with IBM, uh, or, um, uh, or your company who can help accelerate the transformation journey, then we should definitely look at that because I think we definitely need partners to accelerate the transformation journey and to leverage uh, what latest we have uh, out there so that we can quickly launch these experiences and slowly we evolve as the technology is changing. But we should not make it like a... um, a program which runs for multiple years because by the time we will design, develop, and launch, the technology would have changed. So we have mm-hmm. to make sure we launch something to the market, slowly evolve, and also we should uh, have the product organization also part of this uh, because their inputs are very important to understand uh, from the business persona what uh, is the success for the business. Uh, so they have we have to involve them from the very beginning 
and come up with uh, the execution plan, how we can quickly launch the portals to the market that can add value for the business. And I think that that brings us full circle because like you can't, you can't get developer success without having something in production. You need to really quickly be able to spin something up, mm-hmm. get immediate feedback, and then start iterating and developing further. That's correct. Mm-hmm. I think that's yeah. very important. Maybe last question. Is there anything uh-huh. you would like to plug? Is there something that you would like people to go and check out? Um, I would say um, definitely we should look at some of these capabilities uh, that are provided by the public cloud providers, Mm -hmm. uh, both Google and Microsoft and AWS, and see if we already have some engagement with some of these public cloud providers, and if we can leverage um, some of the -the out-of-the-box capabilities that they are providing to launch, to accelerate the enterprise API portals, and also have the complete end-to-end solution which provides security, compliance, and visibility, then we should definitely uh, explore and uh, look for uh, those opportunities to see how we can leverage those um, products or tools that are out there uh, on some of these uh, cloud providers. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank thank you very much. And thank you for... um, like spending your time in <laughs> like your precious free time in between jobs on on an interview with me um i wish you really awesome starts to your new role and fantastic success with a new organization and i'm very much looking forward to seeing what you what you're going to do in your new role and uh, how it all will evolve thank, yeah thank you so much and uh, i really enjoyed this discussion and uh, Thank you uh, for inviting me. Thank thank you, Evander. This episode was brought to you by Pronovix. You can learn more about our company at pronovix.com. Thank you for listening. That's it for this episode. 